Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth, where I talk to artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals. And today I have a very special guest, a former guest uh, alumna, Summer Bozeman. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. We know each other because we work together at Visit Savannah, which is the uh, destination marketing organization for Savannah, Georgia. Uh, and you have a background in tourism and destination marketing. So tell me what you're doing now. Well, right now I am the director of communications and marketing at the YMCA of Coastal Georgia, um, which is an alliance that encompasses 10 physical facilities and 57 program sites total. Over eight counties. What falls under your umbrella as far as like being the marketing person? Primarily um, message strategy. So uh, message strategy, communication strategy, anything involved with marketing or graphic design or video production or the website, um, ad buying, anything related to communications, somehow that lands on my desk. And I know it's, uh, I know it can be a struggle for a lot of people when you have a organizational goal or organizational message you want to get out there, but you also are managing other communicators and people have different styles of scheduling posts or drafting, you know, you've got brand guides, you got colors, you got your logo. How do you kind of like keep, you know, a cohesive look across all those different branches? How do you try to do that? I think that's the question. Um, YUSA, which is our national resource office, provides our brand guidelines. And then it's sort of my job to translate that into language for people who are not professional communicators or professional graphic designers or professional marketers. So distilling it down into these are the things that are important to remember when you're delving into whatever design software that you're using. Um, in the past, it had been sort of... Um, uh, difficult to keep everybody rounded up into um, maintaining those brand guidelines. So there were some people using Publisher, some people were using Canva. Um, our National Resource Office provides uh, templates, but sometimes they're in InDesign and not everybody either has access to InDesign or experience with InDesign. So um, one thing that we did was uh, to subscribe to a web-based design program called Mark, which is very similar to Canva, um, except it's got some, actually, I think Canva has started to implement some lockable elements now, but this was this was pre, pre-lockable Canva, so that I can create a branded template and each element can be lockable with different permission levels. Um, that way they can add copy that's relevant to their branch and their audience without necessarily changing the colors or changing the size and making it look crazy. Um, I can completely lock down the logos so they don't end up stretched or run up against um, images or under images or inappropriately over images. And uh, that has helped a good bit. But I still think that getting together with people regularly and talking about what we're supposed to be conveying with our communications is critical. And that is actually really difficult with people spread across an eight county area, um, especially um, counties that are as big as ours. We have a really big footprint. So trying to get everybody in one place, even trying to get everybody on a Teams meeting is kind of a heavy lift. Can you, can you kind of talk about the services of, at least in our area, like what people could why they should join the Y and what kind of services that y'all provide? Yeah, well, that is also a really expansive question because the Y is known as um, maybe when you think of the Y, you think of basketball because basketball was invented at the Y at 1891. Or you might think of youth sports because that's a big thing that we do. Or you might think of a fitness center because most Ys have a fitness center. Um, you might think of the YMCA song, which is about the resident facilities that um, most Ys don't have anymore. But um, I think of swimming lessons because like when I was five, that's where I went. Yeah, well, um, safety around water is a critical YMCA initiative, especially in a coastal community like ours. So um, YUSA is, uh, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. So we operate um, in three different areas of focus, which are healthy living, social responsibility, and youth development. So um, everything that we do needs to check at least one of those boxes. So things like swim lessons are um, definitely youth development, but you could also call that healthy living, you know, um, providing safety around water instruction, 
particularly in a coastal community like ours, which has oceans and retaining ponds and rivers, we have a lot of water in a community like ours. So making sure that children are um, comfortable around water and safe around water and then can advance to swimming lessons and then to a swim team. And um, when they join a swim team, they're getting um, socialization, they're getting social-emotional learning, um, they're learning how to be coached, which is critical for working, you know. Um, So all of those skills are coming out of programs at the YMCA. As we talk about like youth sports, one thing that I like to remind people is that this isn't really a soccer program. This is a mentoring program. Mm. So we need to make sure that we're... Team building and leadership, all that. Exactly. We're we're forming bonds with people. We're um, encouraging children to form bonds and that they're learning more than just how to play the game. Um, There are lots of places where you can just learn how to play soccer or basketball or whatever. Uh, but it's it's important that they're getting something more than that because all of our programs need to fit within at least one of those three columns. So we do have physical fitness centers which fit into our, um, our healthy living column. We do um, mission-based programming in the community, like um, a no-cost fresh food distribution, which mm-hmm. is data-based, um, where our director of outreach programs, Laura Schmarkey, went in her car and... Uh, sat in neighborhoods and and took tally information on people who were walking through those neighborhoods, identifying neighborhoods where you have to take more than one bus to get to a grocery store or where it's more than a mile from a grocery store. So um, we would call those neighborhoods low access neighborhoods, or some people call them food deserts. Um, So one thing that we do twice a month is we go into those neighborhoods and provide free, fresh produce and bread. Um, in an effort to improve health outcomes for people and um, community build, to to get people out of their homes and meeting other people and knowing that we're there and um, doing what we can to support them. As well as um, some, you know, uh, cornerstone events, partnering with local businesses. I'm thinking of specifically like the Kreitz Tiger Run. That's a big, it's a big thing and right. brings people together, raises awareness. And the thing is like, you're not, no matter where you live in around Savannah, at least, and probably around the country, like, you're not far from a YMCA. Yeah, exactly. Um, we have 10 branches and they're uh, in seven different counties. So um, most of them are going to be in Chatham County, kind of around our, our metropolitan core. Um, we also have them as far afield as McIntosh County, which is uh, down in Darien. And Statesboro, we've got one in Effingham County, and we've recently spoken to some city leaders in Guyton about maybe a second one in Effingham County somewhere down the road. Again, an effort to provide needed services. What we mostly talked about um, with the Guyton City Council and the mayor and um, attendees at this town hall meeting were that they are looking for senior programming with transportation because again, it's a big rural county and um, a lot of seniors in this small community of Guyton have a difficult time making the 20 minute drive to the Effingham County branch, which is in Rankin. So they're looking for socialization. Um, They're looking for low impact exercise to, to keep them healthy in their older age. And um, they're looking for things for kids to do in a rural community. They're looking for summer day camp. They're looking for things to keep kids out of trouble, all of those kind of things. And those are goals of the YMCA to provide those community support avenues. And you mentioned the um, the Tybee Run Fest. Um, this is a two-day, five-event um, run where um, there are five different distances. If you run all of them, you have run 26.2 miles. Um And uh, so this supports our healthy living initiatives, but it also all of the funds from this event go back into our youth focused programming. So those are going to provide scholarships for kids who want to play sports or um, who need to go to day camp or who um, need to access our before and after school care options. All of that's going to go directly into that family focused programming. So I'm definitely aware of the struggles that um, somebody in charge of the overall marketing would face as far as a cohesive message and maybe like some brand managers are very like go getter initial like very uh driven as far as the messaging some like want to work with the overall 
corporate or the big picture um, messaging. And then other people are either not lazy, but they're too busy. They, they, they just are a little like less receptive to feedback. Have you ever gotten um, an idea from somebody that is falling under your umbrella that you're like, yeah, that's like a really cool idea. All the time. And how do you kind of implement that for other branches? Absolutely. All the time. Well, um, let me start by saying um, managing a communication strategy is a big job. And um, maybe if I had a staff of 20, I could feel like I was covering all the bases. But, you know, there's you're never I feel I don't think you're ever going to feel like you're doing a good job at everything. So, um uh, my predecessor, who is a friend of ours, was specialized in a completely different lane. So um, most of her work sort of leaned in the marketing direction. I'm specialized in media relations and communication. So most of the work that I do or I naturally think of leans in that direction. One of you, my favorite quote from the last podcast, which, by the way, if you're listening, Summer has been on the pod before I'll talking about all about PR. What, something that really stuck with me is you said that um, relationships is the currency of pro- PR professionals, basically. Well, since I know that I'm naturally going to lean in this direction and my strategies are kind of going to cover this list before they start covering this list or that list or that list, um, I try to be collaborative with people. Um, I was able to hire a a part-time communications assistant who has been a godsend and he specialized in a completely different area. So uh, I thought that it was important that he can do things that I can't do so that we're sort of filling in the gaps together. Um, I think that there would be some people who would not want to hire somebody who can do things that they can't do or would be threatened by someone who is able to do things they can't do. Or I don't, I don't worry about him making me look bad, though. I, I love when he looks good. I love to push him out in front and be like, I picked him. Um, but I think it's important to collaborate with um, – not just people on your staff, but cross-functional people um, whose work is going to overlap with mine. And um, I'm talking about like fundraising and um, membership recruitment. Membership is a whole different department, but we end up promoting the same sort of things. So it's important that we are moving in the same direction. Um, Each one of those branches has different needs and the person assigned to be the um, I suppose the brand advocate is usually going to be the the director, the executive director of that branch or their sort of right hand, the membership director. Mm-hmm. And those people are going to have varying levels of experience in social media or um, press release writing or various other things, you know, graphic design. They're, they're making a lot of flyers or rat cards or whatever. Uh, so I think it's important that we're all talking about what we're doing and what we think is important and that nobody is really stepping on anybody else's ideas that we're sort of maybe refocusing. If this is going off in a direction where everybody else is going this way and somebody's going that way, you know, we can maybe try and re-strategize to bring everybody together so that we're not pulling in varying directions. If somebody says, Oh, I'm a photographer, that could mean portraits or that could mean landscapes or architectural or like there's so many different avenues of just like working with a camera it's the same thing you can say oh i'm a writer you know by the way uh, summer is a published author but um but i mean there's like you said there's just so many different backgrounds and experiences people can bring into a marketing role that's what makes the field great and like a especially like a degree in marketing or communications whatever but also, you know, you really kind of got to work to figure out what you want to do, which is a great transition point to I'm a big believer in uh, following, you know, following your passions, but like doing work that you're like very passionate about, which led us, uh, which, uh, you know, maybe had to do with some uh, whiskey sours that we're sipping on um, to uh, we started talking about music, music, music history, musical heritage, um, in Savannah. And then, um, you were a very big advocate for Macon, Georgia, which, you know, a a lot of people speak very highly about Macon, but some other people get Macon a bad rap, especially if you're familiar with the, uh, the Georgia, you know, geography and Savannah, you know, people, a lot of people just drive through Macon on their way to Atlanta, but there's really a lot to offer there. And so, um, tell us about like 
kind of where we're at and what led to Kamina and Co., which is our, our little joint venture thing. And while you're doing that, I'm going to pour us another uh, whiskey sour. I think that's a great idea. So um, I grew up outside of Macon in a small community outside of what is a small city. And um, I, uh, you know how you are when you're young, you think, I don't want to live here. I want to live anywhere but here. So after I graduated from high school, I ran away and um was trying to get a job at a time when uh, communications jobs were difficult to get. Thank you very much. And um, ended up moving back in with my parents and sending out resumes to everybody in Macon um, saying, I, I'm a published author. I have a communications degree. I really need some real life experience. Could you use some free help? And um, uh, the first organization that got back to me was a uh, public-private partnership called Newtown Macon, which is um, focused on community building and um, economic development, small business development, and trying to bring people back into Macon's urban, I mean, urban for a small city corridor. You know, they're beautiful building stock, beautiful housing stock. And... Um, uh, that was kind of my first uh, learning experience about what Macon really was, because I had uh, rejected it as a younger person. And um, th through working at Newtown, I met um, uh, my mentor, who was at the time the vice president of marketing for the Macon CVB. They call themselves Visit Macon now. And uh, she CV CVB being Convention and Visitors Bureau, which is DMO Talk, DMO being Destination Marketing Organization. It's all travel tourism jargon. But we yes. really like acronyms. Yes, we love our acronyms. Um, so I uh, I met Ruth Sykes, who was the Vice President of Marketing at um, uh, what is now Visit Macon. And she's a lifelong Maconite, grew up in town. Um, at the right time to be hanging out with all these really cool people in uh, the mid-70s and um, had been at the Macon CVB for almost her entire marketing career, which at that time, I don't know, was probably 25 years. And um, she herself was really enthusiastic about Macon and had all these amazing stories to tell and um, was a great advocate for me too. Um, we really clicked and she took me to all of her meetings and that gave me such an opportunity to hear what people were talking about and to meet all these amazing people and hear their stories. And um, I learned that Macon, which um, is a pretty small city that you really can't see a lot of from the interstate, uh, has this really cool history, this really cool backstory. And uh, I knew that Little Richard was from Macon, and that's really all I knew at the time. And I learned about the Allman Brothers Band, and I learned about Capricorn Records, and uh, the Waldens, and I learned about Chuck Lavelle, and um, Otis Redding. And Otis Redding, how could I forget? Um, and uh, I just loved all of these stories. And since Macon is such a small place, working at the Convention and Visitors Bureau, I had the opportunity to meet a lot of these really cool people. And one of my favorite stories, this was after my convention to visitors bureau time but one of my favorite stories is i was um uh sitting at the bar at grant's lounge which is on poplar street and uh is a, a very famous making music venue and uh, i was sitting next to this older gentleman and i knew that he was robert lee coleman but i didn't really know who robert lee coleman was at the time and i really should have because i was working for an agency that represented Macon at the time but i i, I vaguely knew who he was and um was just sitting there next to him and he had a beer and I had a drink and he was chit-chatting with me and telling me all these amazing stories about how he used to play guitar for Percy Sledge and um, uh, and James Brown and going on tour with James Brown. And then the man got off of his bar stool and it was time for his set and he went and sat down on the stage with his guitar in his lap and just like, I don't know how old he was at the time. He, he was, you know, probably 75, but played like an ace. I mean, the man, I mean, he's Robert Lee Coleman and, um, blew me away. And I, at that moment kind of thought, wow, I'm really in the middle of something special. And so, um, that's one of my favorite things to talk about. History is one of my favorite things to talk about. And, uh, every time I get a little bit tipsy, I start telling music history stories. And, um, that's kind of how we ended up nerding out about music history. And then, um, 
one day I was nerding out about music history and you said, we should make a documentary. And I went, really? I really want to. And um, now we are. Well, that's the goal anyway. Well, we're going to make it. Yeah, we are. So we started, so it, to work towards the documentary film, we've started a YouTube channel. So um, we have a, a couple of videos out so far mm -hmm. that talk about songs that mention Macon, Georgia, yes. facts about, about Macon. History. Exactly. Really, we're basically committed to telling the story of Macon's rich music heritage. Um, but it can start with just these little nuggets. And then we'd like to become like it's become the all encompassing thing that cements make. And like a lot of people that are in the know know about Macon already. But, you know, Memphis Muscle Shoals Macon has a nice ring to it, mm -hmm. you know. And so if that becomes a more widely recognized thing and we can contribute to that, mm -hmm. um, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Well, um, after the Muscle Shoals documentary came out, which is probably like 10 years ago now, um, I feel like it was a couple of years before I watched it. And Ruth was the one who said, you really need to watch this. This is really amazing. Dwayne Allman started there. Mm -hmm. and he sure did. Um, uh, I saw that documentary and I felt it was really impactful. And I thought this somebody needs to talk about Macon like this. Somebody needs to show Macon this way because Macon is just as cool as Muscle Shoals. It might be cooler. There's a lot more there than a recording studio or two recording studios. The path that people take, the the Southern um, music walk, should include Macon, Georgia. And it's worth coming if you're in Atlanta, or if you're in Savannah, or if you're in Charlotte or, or um, Charleston or Jacksonville, it's worth going to Macon for, for the at least the day. And since we started on this whole thing and I've been learning more, um, everyone that we talk to is like very excited about this concept. And they're like, yeah, Macon has so much to give and so much, so much, such a such a profound story to tell. And it's really not gotten the credit it deserves. And I, I agree fully. And this is from a, I'm a New York, I'm a Yankee, I'm a recovering Yankee folks. <laughs> so I'm, you know, for me to come down to Georgia and having only been to Macon five or six times, like, you know, it's really cemented a special place in my heart. And I'm, I'm honored to uh, have already got to meet some really cool people in the community and, and, and the music history, uh, realm things that i love those little pieces that sometimes get left behind and um macon is a place that has a lot of those little left behind stories that if you don't go and let ruth sykes tell you those stories you know you might not get them um there are a few travel writers who have come back several times um because they're they're like, this is really cool, though. Like, there's more here that I really need to talk about. And for a community that's as small as Macon, that's difficult sometimes. Going from, as a travel marketer, going from a community like Macon, where you have to first educate and then pitch, to a community like Savannah, where there's not really an education element. We're just getting, like, fire hosed with incoming requests, and it's just kind of filtering through them, you know, um... I fear that things like those little bits in Macon um, might get lost one day. And um, I haven't lived in Macon for several years now, but being able to see the development that's happening there uh, in terms of economic development, small businesses that are finally starting to like get a grip and take hold and um, collaboration, people working together and sort of communally lifting that music history. I think... Um, somebody else is going to do this if we don't hurry up and do it. So I, I'm really excited to see that things are kind of starting to gel in Macon. And uh, I want to be part of that. If you are, uh, if you're a music lover, a music history lover, or you happen to know somebody that would be uh, a good connection for us, please let us know. Um, we are not in the funding round of our um, production. So in the meantime, if you just could subscribe to us on YouTube at Community Co Productions and, uh, you know, give us a follow on social media, that would be greatly appreciated. For sure. Yeah. We're getting ready to tell even more stories. Well, thank you so much for coming on. 
Uh, it's been wonderful, and I'm very excited for what we're working on and what's coming next. Um, but to all our listeners, thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth, where I talk to artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals about their path to creative success. And if you have episode feedback or just guest suggestions, you can email me at wecreatetruth at gmail.com. If you're listening on iTunes, please leave us a five-star review. If you are watching on YouTube, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Also, again, head over to Communion Co., like, share, and subscribe over there. You may recognize the voice because you've been listening to me for an hour. And um, But Summer wrote it all. I just read the script. Anyway, uh, appreciate you all for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.